Good morning, Connecting Point family. Um, it is Friday morning, May 1st, uh, and uh, I, I hope that you all are doing well. Um, this far into this whole uh, stay-at-home order, hopefully y'all are starting to find some routines. I know that we're finding some routines at this house, and um, it's helping things go a little more smoothly. Um, we are definitely enjoying this extra time that we've had as a family, and, and I do hope that uh, in the midst of all the craziness, you guys can, can find a silver lining as well. Well, this morning I have yet again the opportunity to bring a devotional thought in relation to our um, following Jesus um, Bible reading plan that we are all doing together as a church. Uh, and our, our readings this morning uh, were out of Joshua and then obviously the psalm and then out of John. And, you know, um, I will say I am excited that we are at the point that we are at in Joshua because um, it seems like all the land has been divvied out and uh, we're going to continue on into the story um, of the people of Israel it's funny that they're already having a struggle with each other. Uh, well, maybe not funny. I guess maybe more sad. Um, and they finally got into the promised land, and then all of a sudden they're they're bickering with each other over um, what one did and that shouldn't have done, but then it was okay. I'm talking about the altar thing that was discussed this morning. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. The thing that I really would like to focus on is it comes out of John. You know, we're in John chapter 3 today, and... When somebody says John 3, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Well, for me, 16 is the first thing that comes to mind. John 3, well, 16, I'm going to finish your statement. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's like the first Bible verse I ever learned. Um, it's the Bible verse that sticks with me. It's a Bible verse that many people... <laughs> Uh, have and have stuck with them. It's tattooed on people's bodies. It's worn in eye paint uh, for athletes. Um, people have it on signs, and, and it's just it's a it's a widely known verse. Um, but the interaction that surrounds this verse is one that I got super intrigued by as I read it this morning and. You know, in reality, this is an interaction. This interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus is uh, an interaction that has always, I guess, caught my attention uh, just because of its unique uh, uniqueness. Uh, this this Pharisee who is, you know, supposed to be like the arch nemesis of Jesus. Well, Jesus is the arch nemesis of the Pharisees. I, I don't think Jesus was the nemesis uh, from his perspective, but I do think that the, the Pharisees kind of treated him as such. And um, But this Pharisee, Nicodemus, comes to Jesus in, in the quiet of the night, um, in the secrecy of the night, uh, to have a conversation with him, to find out more. Um, and Jesus talks to him, uh, responds to him, answers his questions. Um, and there's this, there's this answer that he gives, um, specifically he's talking about being born again. Um, and, and this answer has always been interesting to me, right? And, and I mean, this is kind of where we get this idea of, uh, in Christ, we're a new creation and we are born again. We are born into the family of God. Um, and I guess something that, that Jesus says a little further on is the thing that has always stuck out to me. It's, it's also something that, is, if I'm honest with you, has kind of confused me. I've heard many people um, give their take on what is being communicated here, uh, and all of it sounds good, uh, and I'm not dismissing any of it whatsoever, but... For some reason, it's all this this statement that Jesus makes has always been something that's like, man, I just I really wish that I could like sit down with Jesus right now and ask him like, what actually are you saying here? 
Um, and then today, as I read this passage and read those words again, something jumped out at me. And uh, I'd like to take you through that. And maybe, maybe it'll clear things up for you. Maybe it won't. Uh, I'm not really sure if it's cleared anything up for me, but it was just something that jumped out at me. And, I, and I'd like to kind of take you guys on that journey. So there, there's this statement that Jesus makes. Um, he, he says, uh, he, he makes the statement that, you know, unless somebody is born again, they cannot have the kingdom of, be in the kingdom of God. Nicodemus asks, you know, how is that even possible? You can't possibly go back into the womb. Um, and, and, and Jesus responds in verse five, um, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Um, and so this is that piece that is, has always kind of had me wonder, like, what is Jesus saying? And, you know, uh, first thing comes to mind, you know, water and the spirit, first thing comes to mind is baptism, right? Like, unless, unless you have uh, entered the waters of baptism, uh, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. I, that's the thing that hit me. But no, that's not right. That's not right. So it's like, what, what is he saying? What is he saying? Um, and, you know, as I read this and then read further, so, so I, I already had this this question in my mind of what, what is Jesus saying here? But then I, I kept reading, right? That, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to continue reading because, you know, maybe we can pick up what Jesus is saying as he speaks further. So I, I kept reading. And then, you know, I get to John three sixteen for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would have, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, I, I get to that point. And then just before that, it talks about how the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And, and as I read those, you know, I, I immediately think thought to, okay, so for God to so love the world, the greatest like symbol of his love for the world was, yes, sending his son, and, but then like his son dying on the cross, right? Like Jesus being crucified. And so... Keep, again, keeping in mind this, like, being born of the of water and the Spirit. Um, so I, I go to the crucifixion because this is the image that I'm starting to get. Like, he, he immediately starts talking about the crucifixion, immediately starts talking about what's going to happen. And so I go to the crucifixion account in John, and um, it, it, it hits me that the two things... That, that Jesus says we must be born of, right? You must, uh, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. So the two things that we must be born of to enter the kingdom of God are two important pieces that enter the narrative of the crucifixion story right at the moment of Christ's death. And maybe it's poetic, simply, but I, I, I got to believe that there's something more there. And so let me let me tell you let me show you what I what I mean by that. Um, so specifically, if you're at John chapter 19, uh, starting in verse 28 and kind of carrying through to, to verse 37, that's that's like Jesus's death, actually. Um, but uh, Jesus asks for a drink. He says he's thirsty. He receives that. And in verse 30, he says, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, so this is an important piece. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Okay, so there's one of those pieces. But then if you read a little further, um, the other piece comes into play. Uh, da, 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 da. Going down, it was common practice in that day at, when the Romans would crucify somebody that um, typically uh, somebody being crucified would actually die as a result of suffocation because they were hanging for so long. Um, but people, the, the, the crucifixion itself would carry on for a long time 
and I'm sorry for kind of this gory conversation, but it would carry on. It, it would last a long time because, you know, people would fight and they wouldn't want to die. And so they would, they would like push up and lift up on their arms and push up with their feet and, and try to relieve some of that weight so they could take a breath. And there would always come a point where the Romans soldiers that were watching it would say, you know, enough's enough. Uh, it's time for us to cut this guy off. And, and so they would come through and they would actually break the legs of the people being crucified so they could no longer push up to take a breath. And that, would, that was kind of a mercy that they were offering so that they, they could actually die. Well, see, Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He died before that happened. And... Um, but the, this moment had, had come, and so the, the soldiers were coming to break the legs. Um, they came to Jesus, and they found that he was already dead, it says. This is verse uh, 33. And did not break his legs. And then verse 34. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of... You would have automatic, like, blood, obviously, right? He got stabbed. Bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. So it's like, what? Okay. So Jesus, back in chapter 3, is talking to Nicodemus and tells him that unless you are born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, enter the kingdom of God. And then at the moment of Jesus' death, well, and then, so... You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of the blood of, of water and the spirit. And then he goes on to talk about his sacrifice, his crucifixion um, through different words. But that is what's being referenced. And then you fast forward to the crucifixion and the very things that kind of bookend his death. So just before he dies, he gives up his spirit. And just after he is pierced and blood and water come flowing from his body you you get these two pieces again and you know as i thought about this and as i reflected on this some more i i couldn't help but think that perhaps when jesus said unless you are born of water and spirit you have no place i couldn't help but think that Jesus had to have his crucifixion in mind. Jesus had to recognize what was going to happen and, and understand what was going to happen and be kind of telling Nicodemus that, like, it's not about the law, right? These are Pharisees, right? So these Pharisees elevate the law and think that that's going to be the ultimate thing that saves them. And Jesus is trying to... to kind of reprogram his thinking and say it's not this but it is in fact and it is only when you are born of water and the spirit and water and the spirit are present at the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and you know as i think about that it is the blood of Christ that actually has has made the way for us to be cleansed for us to be purified but it is the water, if we're thinking about water and the purpose that it serves throughout Scripture, it is water that actually brings life to us. We, we are atoned for through the blood of Jesus, but it is in the water that is pouring forth from our crucified Savior that brings us life and brings us through into this new birth in the family of God. And it is from the spirit that was breathed out of Christ with his dying breath that we now receive the power to live in the strength of Christ. And so I guess, I, I mean, again, maybe it's just poetic. But this morning I, I found myself kind of excited as I read this perplexing statement about unless you are born of water and spirit you have no place I got excited when all of a sudden all of these other pieces of imagery started to flood in and I realized what I just laid out here that it's not it has a lot less to do with 
kind of restarting or um, starting over in, in any way and more to do with like, I don't know, taking on the very, in essence, the very essence of Christ. So unless we are atoned for with the blood of Jesus and brought to life with the water that poured forth from him and empowered by the spirit that he breathed, we have no place with him. And so today, as we find ourselves in a time that is kind of surrounded by death, that is surrounded by darkness, if we go on in Jesus' teaching to Nicodemus and recognize the life that we have in this birth through water and, and spirit, we read on and we see that it is through Christ and Christ alone that light has entered the world, that life has entered the world. And so this is the good news that we have the opportunity to take to those around us who are hurting, to take to those around us who are feeling alone, to take to those around us who are experiencing loss and confusion right now, to take to those around us who are experiencing th these dark nights of the soul that they might be going through. That because our Savior was pierced, we can pierce the darkness with his light. Because the very life that flowed through Christ has flowed from the cross and has given us a new life, has, has given us a new birth in him. And so today, I, I hope you find an opportunity, you find a way, whether it's through Facebook or some kind of social media messaging system or through a text message or a phone call, today I hope that each of you, each of us, find a way to speak, pour out the, the water of life and breathe out the power of the Spirit into those around us who need it so desperately. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share with you this morning. And um, as I said, I, I hope and I pray that this life and this power that, that is poured out from Christ finds its way into our lives today. Have a good day, guys. Talk to you later.